great advice, uh, doctor, for those of us who, as Dr. Katz just so eloquently put, are accumulating the lint of arduous living. <laughs> Up next, Dr. Katz, we have somebody with the initials DF. DF, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please, with Dr. Katz. Thank you for uh, giving me a chance to ask Dr. Katz question. And Dr. Katz, I am a big fan of yours. You're one of the, uh, the, the best uh, presenters I've ever encountered. Uh, thank you so much for everything you do. Um, so I have a, you. You're also a walking encyclopedia of research. Uh, I have a couple of questions to ask you. Um, perhaps the first one is very quick. Do we have any definitive research showing that naturally occurring trans fat in meat and dairy is bad for human health, like artificially introduced uh, trans fat. I think I, I, remember, I remember reading something um, uh, from the Institute of Medicines uh, at one point, maybe, maybe the IOM is still saying that, that naturally occurring trans fat in animal products is actually uh, actually has some health benefits, but I'm not sure whether I uh, my memory has failed me or not. So that's the first question. The second question: Earlier this year, there was a research uh, published uh, in the American Journal of Clinical um, Clinical Nutrition, I believe that's what it's called, um, saying that uh, there there was no significant association between unprocessed red meat and poultry intake and mortality. Um, uh, I, I know the database they use uh, came from the pure study. And I know that th there has already been a lot of uh, rebuttal um, provided by the health, uh, True, True Health Initiative and other uh, healthcare practitioners as well uh, um, for the uh, pure study last year. Uh, or maybe the year uh, two years ago, uh, but in any case, I wonder whether you, uh, what your thoughts are on the on the one that was published earlier this year. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for your very kind words. That they're they're very much appreciated. And two excellent questions. So on the topic of naturally occurring trans fat, uh, you, you asked, is there definitive research showing harmful, not harmful? And and in particular, you mentioned definitive science related to trans fats occurring naturally in, in meat and dairy. The answer is no, uh, because there has been no, imagine, you know, essentially if you're talking about the isolated effect of trans fat in meat and dairy, well, then you can't have everything else in meat and dairy. You really just want to study the trans fat. So you have to isolate trans fat from meat and dairy and administer it to people, I guess, versus a placebo, kind of like a drug trial. So you'd encapsulate the naturally occurring trans fat extracted from the meat and dairy, administer that to people versus a placebo. I've not seen that done. It's probably unethical because high doses of trans fat do tend to be harmful. The, the potential for beneficial effects probably refers to the literature on medium chain triglycerides. So some trans fats are of different chain length. There is some argument that medium chain triglycerides are potentially beneficial, anti-inflammatory and so forth. And there are some trans fats in that fat class, but again, no definitive evidence one way or the other, but it's more interesting than just meat and dairy. So, you know, again, this is an audience that is not very interested in eating meat and dairy, but some of you may be inclined as I am to include extra virgin olive oil in your diet. Uh, and there is trans fat at a very low level in olive oil. There's trans fat in a lot of plant foods at a very low level. There are no studies there either where you just isolate the trans fat. It's a little bit like the story with lectins. You really want to know what is the net effect of eating this food? If the net effect of eating the food is harmful, then you, at that point, who really cares if an isolated nutrient is harmful or beneficial? It's a food you mostly want to avoid. If the net effect is decisively good, Similarly, you know, if this nutrient that occurs naturally in the food at a very low level has, is potentially harmful, you know, they're, they're cancer causing compounds in broccoli, but the net effect of eating broccoli is much less cancer, not more. So, you know, again, I, I think it sort of gets into the realm of what is the active ingredient, but the, the honest answer to your question is no, there, there is no definitive research on the isolated effects of these naturally occurring trans fats, which reverberate through not just meat and dairy, but many plant foods as well, but they occur at very low levels. They are structurally somewhat different than the willful industrial produced trans fat, partially hydrogenated oils, mostly in terms of the, um, the length of the carbon chains. And that, that does change the, the, the metabolic pathways. On the topic of red meat 
and the PURE study. So the PURE study, which stands for Prospective Urban and Rural Epidemiology, uh, many of you may have heard of it. Uh, quite frankly, with, with all due respect to many colleagues involved in the effort, uh, it's a bit of a disaster. The, the idea behind PURE was that if we look at a massive scale uh, across many, many different countries, dozens if not hundreds of countries, and we, we're sure to include countries that are poor and rich, and we look at dietary patterns and health outcomes, we will understand better than anybody ever did before, and we will speak a, a more potent truth. Uh, but that's incredibly um, misguided. Uh, I'll give you a quick example, and then I'll come back to Pure and Meat. Imagine doing a study of the health effects of swimming. And imagine that you, you want to know the health effects of swimming as an exercise on as big and diverse a population as possible. So you include in your study people who know how to swim and people who don't know how to swim, and you throw them all in the same pool. Well, the people who know how to swim, swim, and the exercise is good for them. The people who don't know how to swim, drown. So you conclude that there is no effect of, of swimming on health because it harms as many people as it helps. It's preposterous. If you know how to swim, <laughs> then swimming is fantastic exercise. If you don't know how to swim, you can learn how to swim and then swimming can be great exercise. But mixing those two populations together would be idiotic. The Pure Study does that. So there are, there are countries in the mix of the Pure Study where people are protein deficient. Uh, the Horn of Africa, for example, uh, many people in Bangladesh, other places around the world where there is overt protein malnutrition. Well, you know, basically in a situation like that, if you can get some meat into your diet, it's going to be tremendously beneficial to your health. I mean, effectively, you've got starvation to contend with. So fixing starvation is a real good thing for people. Uh, and, you know, if you've got nothing to eat and can get something to eat, eating anything is better than nothing. So there are countries in the pure sample where dairy and meat look good, because, not because, you know, they're, they're necessarily the best choices for people, but we're talking about people who have no choices at all. And the alternative is protein deficiency and starvation. So the families and households that eat meat do better. And if you look in those countries, you know, does eating more meat result in bad or good health outcomes it actually looks good. You then look at affluent countries, the US, Europe, much of the world, where we can eat what we want most of the time. Um, it, it's perfectly clear that eating more meat is associated with bad outcomes, very consistently, very potently. So what the Pure Study has done is muddied the water and confounded the issue by acting like, because we're looking at a bigger scale, we're telling a truth that other studies have missed. Absolutely not. They have, they have such a heterogeneous sample. They are mixing together beneficial effects in a population that's starving, harmful effects in a population prone to obesity, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes, put the two together and concluded no net effect. What all of my respected colleagues ask routinely, and, and my good friend at Stanford, Christopher Gardner, wrote on this very recently commentary in uh, the Journal of the American College of Nutrition, we must always ask instead of what. You, you can't just ask, is, is eating meat good or bad for people? You have to say, instead of what? If it's instead of nothing, you know, if you're talking about people who are starving to death and scraping by on nothing but white rice, that meat is actually good for them. And, and by the way, this is a reason why we want to be careful not to be too dogmatic about plant exclusive eating. Most of us who have good options can be plant exclusive it leaves a little bit of meat available to people who have overt protein deficiency and will actually benefit from it. And I think that at a global scale, I think that redistribution would be fine. Um, we can get into the details of that some other time, but you know, basically there are clearly populations where concentrated protein sources, it doesn't have to be meat, but it, it can be, do them a, a lot of good. You cannot mix together populations where in one, X does good, in the other X does harm, put them together and say no net effect. You have to say instead of what? Uh, when meat is instead of beans or lentils, it's harmful. When eating more meat means eating less uh, vegetables, um, it's harmful. Uh, and that's what it means in the US and much of the modern world. Uh, so I, I find the, the pure study dangerous. Uh, dangerous because it's shockingly wrong, but because of the magnitude of it, it does attract a lot of attention. Uh, and so its capacity to do harm is outsized. And it's a little surprising too, that so many 
researchers have rallied around such a misguided venture. And again, the, the, the people that I respect most and work most closely with have all agreed that the study is pretty much a train wreck. It's going to continue to get attention because it's so big, uh, but it's a big train off the tracks. That's my opinion about that. Uh, and I'm going to need to apologize. I actually have another commitment at the top of the hour. I can maybe do one more question. We're going to have to drop up just a couple minutes before uh, the clock hits four so I can pivot to that one. We, we certainly appreciate it on you, please. Hi, Dr. Katz. Hi, Steve. Pleasure as always to hear from you. Uh, what a mensch. <laughs> Thank uh, you. While we were, while you were talking about the pandemic, uh, there was a young lady, I don't know if you saw the chat, that started to push, uh, ask about Gert van der Bosch and his call to halt vaccinations, uh, Sherry Tenpenny's, uh, that the vaccine is going to do harm, Judy Michovich's pandemic movie. We've been inundated with this stuff for the last year. How do we, how do we do a debate? This is sort of like a religious, how do you talk to somebody who wants to believe? And when you say, look at this, they say, oh, you can't believe that because that's funded by George Soros or Bill Gates or, <laughs> or God Almighty. Or, you know, but there's always an answer and it's never to the, to, to the issue. Right. The, the, the other question I wanted to ask you is over the years, personally, my uh, blood counts have always been on the low side, uh, white blood count, red blood counts. Uh, you know, is there a different range for plant based folks that's a little bit lower when it comes to these things? OK, so quick, yeah. Where I'm at. Yeah, Steve, thank, thank you so much. I'm going to answer quickly and I, I apologize. Um, on the issue of vaccines, uh, you know, I try to confront dogma by being as reasonable as I can. I listen to people. I listen to all the arguments against. I listen to the arguments for. I look at the weight of evidence. And I try to speak very calmly and say, I favor, I, I hear you. I understand why you're concerned. You don't completely trust science. You certainly don't trust politics. Uh, and science can do harm, uh, sometimes on purpose, often inadvertently. So I completely respect your reticence. But I know what you know, uh, and I've had training, and I have a family, and I love them, and I want to do what's safest for them, and I choose to get vaccinated, and I'm perfectly happy to tell you why if you want to listen to me. I start there, you know, and then I, I say, you know, it, nothing we do in medicine is completely risk-free. Crossing the street is not risk-free. It's all a matter of shopping the options, looking for the least risk, greatest potential benefit. I love nature. Uh, but frankly, you know, nature is the source of botulinum toxin and rattlesnake venom. Sometimes you need a drug. Uh, and I've been a beneficiary of that. I've, I had anaplasmosis from a tick bite. I was very grateful to receive intravenous tetracyclines. It probably saved my life. So, you know, vaccines are the same. Uh, yeah, they can go wrong. Yeah, they can do harm. But, you know, the net effect of immunization on public health has been absolutely massive benefit. Um, so that's how I feel about uh, confronting the, the dogma issue. Um, I don't know if I really have time to do justice to your second question. Uh, I wonder if I might be able to leave it there and not risk being late for my, my next appointment. I, I really do apologize, but I need these two minutes to pivot. Uh, but Steve, again, really appreciate you all. I do wish we had more time for questions, um, but I'm easy to find. So those of you that want to follow up with me, please do, and we can continue the dialogue.